glad you guys are here. If this is your first visit, my name is Craig. I'm the preaching pastor, the lead pastor here at Generations, and we're just really glad that you're with us. We hope this is the first of uh, many times uh, together as a part of our family, or what we sometimes call our family, friends who are like family, which is healthy church. So uh, today we're starting off a new teaching series kind of over the summer. A lot of times I've done Old Testament stories. Uh, this time I thought I would do New Testament uh, stories uh, and kind of the stories that, that Jesus told. Uh, and with every sermon series, I have a memory verse. And I know the last couple have been really, really long. You guys are kind of complaining trying to remember all that. So, so we're going to go with a little shorter one this time, all right? Uh, and it's from Psalms. So let's say this together. Whoops. One generation shall commend your works to another and should, shall declare... Go ahead. I'm glad you got it even when I didn't. Psalms 145, 4. And, and how this happens basically is telling of stories. In the Old Testament, there was the passing of stories from generation to generation to generation. Uh, and they would tell the story of what God had done in, in their lives. And, and even things like altars that they built were reminders of what God had done. So when the children of Israel were delivered through the sea, uh, you know, they built an altar. And, and from then on, whenever someone would go by and a kid would say, what's that big pile of stones? Dad would say, let me tell you the story of how God delivered us from slavery, right? And so uh, stories are an important uh, part of us. In fact, um, stories shape who we are, right? Stories are, are what tell you about somebody. And Jesus told all kinds of stories. Uh, parables uh, were stories that kind of had meaning attached to them, and there's just great uh, power uh, in, in stories. And so here's the way I kind of think about it, okay? Facts describe stories give meaning, so if you were to ask about me or to meet me and we were to get together uh, and you said, tell me about yourself. And I said, well, I'm, I'm five foot seven. I'm kind of overweight. You know, I'm, uh, I, uh, you know, I got brown hair. I, I, I like to joke and I, I think I'm funny, but not everybody thinks I'm funny, you know. And this, that, that doesn't tell you a whole lot. You could have all the statistics, you know, my cholesterol is pretty good, you know. So there's one of my kind of praise points. Um, but, but if I were to tell you about my life growing up and, and kind of going to school and my children, and all of a sudden I would be telling you stories and you would really come to know me. And so uh, facts describe, but stories give meaning. Uh, and that's true in the Bible uh, as well. So the story we're going to talk about this morning is one that's about lost and being lost. How many of you have ever been lost? Yeah. How many of you have ever been like really, really lost, kind of scary lost? Yeah. Uh, I, I've that. I grew up just uh, at the base of the um, Olympic National Forest, uh, and so I got lost a few times in there. But the scariest time for me with lostness uh, happened uh, when someone else was lost. I, um, my church used to take the teens up, and we'd go backpacking up in the Olympic National Forest when I was growing up. Uh, and I started out really young. And so by the time I was a junior, senior, um, we would sometimes divide them up. There was a slower group and a faster group. And, and one year, uh, the guy that was in charge said, Craig, take the faster ones. The slower ones are really struggling. And just go. And then you can set up camp and we can all be ready. Great. Love that. Grab my guys. We took off, got up there, set up camp. The rest of them showed up. And he said, hey, where's up? And he came, kind of gave me a name. And I go, well, he was with you. And he said, no, he was with you, right? It, it, evidently, he decided to follow me and didn't get caught up with us. Uh, and somewhere, I had taken a wrong turn and, and got lost. And this was like a middle schooler, right? And it's getting dark in the Olympic National Forest at that point. And while it's not a terribly dangerous place, it's probably not a great place for a middle schooler to be overnight by himself without all of the things that he needs. Uh, and I remember sprinting, and we were like 12 miles up the trail, sprinting down back and going up all the spurs and trying to figure all that out. And just everywhere, I could not find him. I finally came back to camp, just totally discouraged. And there he was. <laughs> and I understood that impulse that you sometimes have with your children where you can't decide whether you want to hug them or kill them, right? <laughs> you know? I was leaning to the kill side, right? Because it was terrifying to me that this, this young, young boy was lost and, and the, the dangers that were out there. And I was thankful that we had a group of people that went to seek them out and to find him. And that was his hope. And somebody had found him down a trail and, and brought him, him back. And so we're going to talk a story about lostness. If you have your Bibles, oops. Luke, uh, turn with your Bibles to Luke uh, 15, 1 through 7. Uh, also, you have the insert, the Bible, the scripture is on the back 
uh, of that. And just, just kind of a quick thing. You'll remember that uh, today when we think about shepherd, we have all these warm memories of shepherds, right? And if you see pictures of shepherds and the lost sheep, the sheep are always clean, the shepherd's always clean, you know, everything's kind of cool. In the first century, it wasn't like that. Shepherds were at the bottom of of society. Um, they, they had a bad reputation uh, for being shiftless and, and uh, trespassing, and, and they were actually despised by the religious leaders. Uh, they were in a, in a category uh, that, that they had, and, and the religious leaders th- th- in this category were shepherds and camel drivers. Any of you camel drivers? No? No camel drivers? Okay. Um, sailors, gamblers with dice, dyers, and tax collectors. Uh, and they, were, they couldn't participate in the religious life because they were considered unclean. So this is a really tough group of people. And hold on to that because you're going to need to remember that in just a minute as we jump into this. So let's jump in, beginning at verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. So that's really important. They, they, they are leaning into Jesus. They are not welcome with the Pharisees. They're not welcome at, at you know, temple. They're not all of those places where they're not welcome. But Jesus welcomed them, and they are leaning in. They want to hear. They're hungry for the message. They're moving towards God. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. I love muttered. You know, muttered is a really good word because there's muttering that sometimes happens in church, right? Nobody wants to say it, but you kind of mutter. Some of you are smiling, going, yeah, you too, okay? So this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So it wasn't just that Jesus kind of put up with them. He, he welcomed them. He had this openness to them and, and, and embraced them, okay? And so just to say it kind of plainly, uh, Jesus doesn't just tolerate sinners. He welcomes them, okay? That, that is our Jesus, that, that he welcomes us, this openness uh, to them. Uh, the Greek word carries the idea of kind of warm reciprocity, right? This, this connection to people who, who ne- aren't necessarily following him, don't necessarily believe in him. And, and this, this whole thing would have rocked the world of the religious leaders at the time, you know, because he's, he's welcoming sinners. They barely tolerated him, you know, pump, pull your cloak close, maybe do a little business with them, but you certainly didn't welcome them, okay? But here's what Jesus did. Jesus, um, Jesus, Jesus prioritized mission over purity. The religious leaders were deeply concerned about purity and had tons of rules about it, but Jesus was deeply concerned about the mission of bringing people into transformational relationship with God. Okay. And those two sometimes exist, and it's hard sometimes, because you're going, well, you know, I don't know, and this, but, but Jesus stamped really clearly which one mattered most, and that is that, that people mattered most in all of that, and so he eats with them, which in their culture was a really big deal, big deal, a table fellowship where you sit down and eat, that was to say, this person isn't just someone that it's okay, it's out there, when you invite someone to your table, or you accept an invitation in the first century as a Jew, you were saying, these are my people. Right? And he's sitting with the sinners and the outcasts. Say, these are my people. Okay, that's what he's all about. So, having kind of told them that, they didn't get it particularly. And so Jesus told them a story to help clarify. Okay? Then Jesus told them this parable, story with a meaning. Purpose, uh, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Now he is right now, he has offended them. Because these are the most religious, most pure folk, and he just told them that they're one of the shepherds who just by definition of the job they do can't participate in the religious life of Israel. I, I, I love this idea. You know, I, I don't want to offend people, but Jesus sometimes, man, he just went right for it. <laughs> okay? So, uh, what, the sheep loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And the answer to that question is No! You don't. You, you, you don't. you don't leave them in the field. I mean, I know in the Matthew passage they get into the, the pen and they're all safe. But in this passage, they're out in the open field. And you have to keep in mind, sheep are not pets. Sheep are, are part of their economy. They're, they're a business sort of thing. And, and, and you just if you think about it just a minute from yourself, you wouldn't invest everything you have on the chance of getting 1% back and the high chance that you would lose money. How many did you take that kind of deal? Yeah, none of you would. Well, that, that, it doesn't make sense in this context either. It, it, it's kind of crazy. So, so now they're confused because Jesus is telling them a story that doesn't make any sense because he says, which of, one, which of you would do this? And they're all going, like, none of us would do that, okay? 
Uh, verse 5, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts, on, he puts it on his shoulders. Okay, this is something I learned this time I didn't realize before. Because, you know, all of, the, all of the images I see of the good shepherd kind of bringing the sheep back, it's always like a little lamb and you're kind of petting it, you know, and that sort of thing. You know. This was a full-grown sheep, okay? This would have weighed a lot. And one of the characteristics of sheep when they get lost, again, I don't know this, I read this because I'm not a shepherd, but one of the characteristics of sheep when they get lost, they sit down and, and they won't move. And so even after the shepherd gets to them, they won't walk back. They sit down. They're afraid. And the, the shepherds literally have to put them around their shoulders in order to get them back to the flock of sheep. And then when they see the flock of sheep, then they're, they're ready to go. So this whole thing of putting them on the shoulders is, is a part of this rescue. The, the shepherds had to work really hard uh, to get through this and to rescue uh, the sheep. Uh, and so he brings them on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. Uh, I have found the, my lost sheep. Or what we would say, holy party. Say holy party. holy party. Yeah, when you come back to Jesus, there is holy party in, in heaven in a big sort of way. I can't wait. I am going to dance in heaven and embarrass you all. It's Because okay? it is holy, holy party. So, uh, and then verse 7. Oops, boy, this thing wants to go too on these. Um, uh, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And some people take this personal like, wait, what about me? I'm, you know, I've repented all of that. It's not about you. It's about the celebration that there's good for everyone that comes back. Amen? Back to that holy, uh, that holy party that he wants to do in us. So let's draw a couple things out of this. One of them is you are extraordinarily valuable to Jesus. Amen. This is a story in which Jesus kind of plays the role of the, the shepherd, and he literally puts everything at risk. The whole flock is at risk in order for him to go and rescue the one, right? You know, and Jesus did that. Jesus put everything at risk in order to come and rescue us. He stepped down from heaven. He came and lived amongst us. And honestly, if you're looking at it from a business perspective, everything that could go wrong did go wrong, and he ended up crucified. By any other standard, you go, well, that's a disaster, okay? Now, if you didn't know about the resurrection, but that's a supernatural in intervening of God in the midst of it, you'd go, his whole life was a struggle. He only had 12 disciples, right? You know, and in the upper room, there's like 120, three years of work, the Son of God, God in the flesh, and he risked everything for you and for me. And that's, that's kind of something, I saw, I saw a meme that's helped me with this. It says, Jesus leaving the 99 to find one seems illogical, irrational, and senseless until that one is you. Amen? Until that one is you, then you go, oh man, you know, if, I, if I'm lost, I hope there's somebody out there looking for me. I hope there's somebody running down the trails. I hope there's a shepherd that's willing to not only find me, but pick me up and get me back where I belong and clean me up and, and take care of me. And, and so I am here to tell you that, that Jesus has gone to extraordinarily lengths to bring you back and vows you beyond what you can imagine. But not only that, Jesus places extraordinary value on the person you are praying for. That is such good news. I don't know about you, but I have some people in my life that I am praying for, and it matters a lot to me how it goes with them. It, it, it's something that I, I'm just, I, it's hard for me. And, and the good news is this, Jesus loves them more than you do. Not because you are incapable of love, but because he is capable of more love than you, amen? Okay? Which means the only person whose heart is more broken than yours is Jesus over their separation and, and the only person that, and, and Jesus is less willing to be separated from them than you are because he loves them more. Think about that. Okay, if you're less, you don't want them to miss heaven, it's just such a big deal for you. It's even more so for Jesus because he loves them more than you do. So, Jesus will go to unreasonable, irrational, dangerous lengths to bring home sinners. Man. Read this, especially if you have someone who is far from Christ. You need to read this. You need to write this down. You got a thing in there with the notes. You can put it down there. Let's say this together. Jesus will go to unreasonable, irrational, dangerous lengths to bring home sinners. We should all be dancing in the aisles, okay, through all of that. It, he, he just will do so much because, and we said this earlier, Jesus risked everything, everything 
to rescue you. Isn't this a great story that Jesus told? I mean, it's just, it's so wonderful um, how he worked in all of this. But let me ask you some awkward questions. You ready for awkward questions? <laughs> some people are like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> Here's my question. Do we really desire to have unchurched people in our church? Yeah, that, that's the Sunday school answer. That's the answer I was taught. That's what, as soon as I thought of this, that's what, what I, I wanted to say. But here's the problem. I, I took a little philosophy when I was in school. And one of the things they taught me had to do with values. And here's the way it kind of got summed up. Our values are what we do, not what we say. Amen. That has been a torture for me in my life. They're what we do, not what we say. And honestly, we live in a time when churches are not just unwelcoming to unchurched people, but in some ways they seem hostile to unchurched people, right? It's just, it drives me crazy. And, and so the truth of the matter is so many churches, and I hope not us, but so many churches want unchurched people that fit a particular form and have, you know, well-mannered and middle class and understand the rules of church, which is kind of a contradiction in terms. How can an unchurched person understand the rules of church, right? So what if church people behave like unchurched people? Surprise, surprise. I mean, what are you going to do if you go out in the foyer and you hear somebody swearing? <sighs> My grandmother would roll over in her grave. <laughs> or cigarette butts out front. Or getting up during the service too many times and going in and out. That's a problem, by the way. <laughs> or kids running around, maybe even tearing some stuff up. Or maybe the smell of pot or body odor. I mean, what if a biker or a whole bunch of bikers pulled up to our church and they're showing too much skin and their tattoos and they got their big motorcycles and they come in? You okay with that? Yeah. I hope so. I mean, here's something even worse. What if a Democrat comes to our church? <laughs> or a Republican? <laughs> what if a professional politician from the wrong party starts coming to our church? What if a homeless person starts coming to our church? And here's what I want to say. I know I'm preaching to the choir because we have homeless people that come to our church and you love on them. And I love you for that. Okay? Absolutely. So here's another one. This one's personal. What if a child with ADHD starts coming to our church? I mean, you should all give great thanks to the people in the little church I grew up with because they went through a lot to let me be in church. Our special needs. What if culture comes to our church? We're supposed to love those people in, in, in all that we do. So, let's ask this question. We're going to assume, you know, that hospitality... Oop, did we miss one here? Oh, so how do we welcome sinners? What does that look like? When I was growing up, we had evangelism and it looked a particular way, but that doesn't work anymore. It's completely different. Here's what does work. Hospitality is making unchurched people feel welcome. People who are far from God, feeling like they belong, like they're loved, like they're a part of us in all that we do. It's about preparing and being ready and embracing them. Part of it is action, being ready and having things ready to go. Part of it is attitude, how we treat them, how we do things. I have to tell you that one of the most heartbreaking times in my life was one time when a person came to our church a long, long time ago. That just, none of the people involved to go here anymore. And they had a lot of tattoos showing. And I watched somebody look at them and do this and this and turn around and walk away. And that's when I said, we don't want unchurched people in our church. We don't want people who are, who are different, you know, all of that. And by the way, I don't have any problem with tattoos and the whole thing in the Bible about don't have tattoos is, tattoos is about religion, not tattoos. But, but it's, it's a part hospitality, making people feel welcome, okay? And then welcoming means, uh, oh boy, welcoming means prioritizing the needs of guests amen. over those of us that call this home, amen? amen. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go quick here. Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In, in, in uh, Luke 7, uh, early on in this passage, they give him that name. Think about that for a minute. He was a friend. And, and friend is, is such an important part of this. It, it carries the idea of, of in, in the original language, of, of loved or prized. 
uh, of personal kind of emotional connection and personal intimacy, emotional intimacy, of, of trusted confidant, of one held dear in a close bond of personal affection. Does that describe us? I don't know that it does. I don't know that it describes me. I mean, I have some friends that are, that are not followers of Jesus and, and I love them and I care for them, but I don't know that I'm at that level yet. And I don't know that people would call very many evangelical churches friends of sinners. I've decided if I ever to, to plant a church, and I'm way too old to plant a church, um, I would call it friend of sinners church just because I think that would be a challenge to everyone that goes there, amen? <laughs> it, would, it would just be a constant uh, reminder. Um, and, and, and we need to get to this place where we're a friend of sinners, i got about six of you. Okay, let's try it again. We need to get to a place where we're a friend of sinners. Yeah. Man, that's at the heart of what Christ is all about. So, do you have at least one person in your life who does not walk with Jesus that you grieve over? Yeah. I, I hope so. I hope there's somebody in your life that it, it just breaks your heart that they're far from Christ. Uh, and that you, you care for them and that you're, you're praying for them. Because so often we talk about, we want to reach our community for Jesus. The good news is there's nobody in my neighborhood named community, okay? There, it, 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 it needs to be personal. You see what I'm saying? It needs to be someone that you care about, that, that, that you love, that, that it breaks your heart, and you would grieve if they were to miss heaven. Grieve deeply. That kind of connection is the evangelism the new generation is looking for. So, one more awkward question. Who are you in the story? Are you the religious leader? That's the one that I have a tendency to go. I fit all the characteristics. You know, the people that are always in trouble with Jesus are the people that graduated from seminary. I hate that. <laughs> the gatekeepers. The ones that, you know, we look at and, and, and I don't know, I'm trying hard to not be that person. Or maybe you're the lost sheep. You don't even know about this whole religion thing. You just know that you're lost and you need something different and that you need God in your life and somehow, and you are so glad that Christ is looking for you and this morning you can meet Him. Or, or maybe you're one of the, the sinners. You've been rejected by the, the religious community and, and pushed out and it doesn't feel like they care about you and maybe God doesn't care about you. I have good news for you. We care about you and God really, really cares about you. I don't know where you are, but it is my pleasure to invite you to come home this morning. The shepherd has found you. It's time to come home and know him. I invite you into a transformative relationship with Jesus Christ. You will never be the same again. Amen. Never again to join the holy party. We're going to celebrate communion in just a minute. And as a part of that, I'm going to pray. And, and when, I, when I'm praying, I want to invite you, if you find yourself in that sinner category, or you find yourself in that lost sheep category, or you know that you need something different and you need to move away from the religious judgmentalism, that you would ask Christ to come in. He'll clean up your past. Praise God, because everybody's got a past. Oh my goodness. Everybody's got a past. Everybody should. Yeah, okay, good, right? We've all got that, and we have all been cleansed by Christ, not by our own effort. Amen? Amen. And so as we uh, approach communion uh, this, this, this evening, this morning, I lost track of days. Yesterday we had the, uh, the volunteer thing, you know, it was after the, you know, I greeted about half the people with good morning at like five o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> this is the Lord's table. This is the table of fellowship this morning. And you're invited. And I, I just want to encourage you. I so love when lost sheep come home, when sinners discover that God loves them and they can be embraced. And so I want to invite you when I pray in just a moment to become a follower of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, this story is so good. So good. And Father, I, I know, I remember when I, I came home, Father. I, I remember the joy. I remember the radical transformation in my life. I remember all that you've done for me. And on, honestly, Lord, I've been all three of those categories. And so, Father, I pray this morning, especially for that one that you're speaking to. And they know they need a change. They know they need something different. They're not even sure what all that looks like. Maybe... Maybe they're the lost sheep. They just don't know about this whole religion thing. But, 
but they know that you're speaking to them. Father, would you help them right now to just say yes to you, that you would come into their lives, to ask you into their lives, to, to forgive their past, Father, and that they would commit their lives to following you. And if you're in that place, would you pray that just silently to Christ? Or maybe, you know, we're a religious leader and we need to confess that we haven't been as welcoming. Or, 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 or maybe in all of this, Lord, we're one of those people that have been rejected by the churches. And Father, I pray that you would just assure them that in this place they are loved. And we are going to be a people that live lives of love, no matter how hard it is, Father. And that they are welcome here and that they can come home now to Christ. And then, Father, I pray that you would welcome them to your table that is before us. That just as you ate with sinners, you still eat with sinners. And that this table is their table too, Father. And that they are welcome in this place. On the night our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember. Remember all that Christ has done for you. Remember that he loves you and wants you at his table. After supper, they took the cup, and when they had again given thanks, they gave it to them, saying, This is my body, my blood, which was shed for you. Whenever you do this, remember. Remember the forgiveness and the grace and the reconciliation. The body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ preserve us blameless unto everlasting life. Let us come to the table of the Lord. Hey church family, thank you so much for watching this video. We hope that God is inspiring you and working in your life. If so, make sure you send this video to a friend so that they can be impacted by the good news of the gospel as well. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss a single video. And as always, we hope that God is continuing to work and move in your life. Thanks again for watching. God bless.